everyone thank you very much for joining us this evening um and this event um looking at transport and in particular asking the big question after hs2 what transport system does yorkshire and humber need so as you will know hopefully this event this evening has is being hosted by the yorkshire and humber climate commission and my name is rosa foster and i'm co-director of that commission uh, and we are delighted to have you all here today. So first of all, a bit of housekeeping to kick us off. So please be respectful to the speakers and to each other. This is the first time that we've done a, a very open uh, Zoom engagement session. So we're really delighted. It's gonna be much more of a discussion um, and hopefully much more engaging uh, than some of our previous sessions that have been a bit more a show and tell kind of approach. Um, so yeah, please do, um, make sure that we uh, abide by all our normal social norms of uh, being polite with each other and understanding we're coming from different perspectives in this and that's part of the process of climate action. Um, if you persistently make noise inappropriately, you will be removed from the meeting. Um, I really hope that isn't something that we'll need to do. Um, and please note that we are recording this event and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, for some time to come. So if you miss a key piece from the speakers, um, you are, you'll be very able to, uh, to check back on it there and also share it around your networks, which we would actively encourage you to do. So our context for today then. Well, transport, as we know, is the biggest source of emissions in our region and our reliance on private cars and the associated uh, congestion also means many places have poor air quality and that is affecting the health and well-being of the people who live in those places um, and, and in no small way. Um, tackling that is a huge challenge and we need to see transformational change in how we move around. And this change needs to happen over the next 10 to 15 years. So transformational change in the next 10 to 15 years. Regional emissions calculations show that the extent of the challenge, uh, show the extent of the challenge. And for example, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority estimates that we need a 30 to 40% reduction in private car usage by 2038. But changes to our transport system generate vocal opposition for some quarters. The most high profile transport initiative for the North, HS2, has now been cancelled by the government and notionally, and that's the sort of premise for today's discussion, is uh, notionally that releases billions of pounds that could be spent elsewhere. But where should that investment be focused? So let's explore that together this evening. So this isn't like a standalone thing where nothing will happen as a result of it. We are um, undertaking an ongoing consultation around transport um, and that is out at the moment and the, um, the link for that consultation will be put in the chat um, and when you go to the, that site you'll see a number of other consultations that you might also be interested in but this evening it's linked to to this transport session um, and it, your feedback and um, sort of questions and prompts um, and reflections through, that we pick up through today's session will feed, we will take into that consultation and will feed directly into our work as a climate commission. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we're very thankful for your time and input. So today um, I'm really delighted to so say we've got three fantastic speakers who will give their own take on this topic. Uh, first we'll hear from Julia Thrift, the Director of Healthier Placemaking at the Town and Country Planning Association. We've got Peter Cole, Head of Decarbonisation at Transport for the North. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Malcolm Morgan, who is a Senior Research Fellow for Transport and Spatial Analysis at the University of Leeds, who will outline the new research about the decline of our bus services. We will have a Q&A session after all of the speakers have spoken. So please save your questions until then, if you can. Um, after the speakers, after we've heard from all of the speakers, what we're going to do is split out into different breakout rooms to get more insight from you all about this topic. Um, we knew that this would be in high demand today. Um, and let me just check the numbers. Yes, we can see we've got over, um, over 60 people in this session today. So what we're planning is to have facilitated sessions in the breakout rooms. Um, don't worry, if you don't want to speak, if you want to keep your camera off and just listen, you're absolutely welcome to do that. 
that. But what we did want to do is create the space for genuine conversation rather than um, like a very like very daunting large room conversation. And finally, we will hear from Kat Armstrong, who has been leading the Commission's work on transport. So without further ado, I'm going to hand uh, over to Julia Thrift. So Julia Thrift, as I've said, um, is Director of Healthier Placemaking for the Town and Country Planning Associate or TCPA, uh, which used to be called the Town and Pla Country Planning Association, I understand. So sorry if I've got that wrong, Julia. Um, Julia is one of the country's experts on the links between the design of the places we live and the quality of people's lives. One of the key factors in that relationship is how we get around. And the TCPA argue for creating complete, compact and connected neighbourhoods, resulting in places that are healthier to live in and that contribute to climate targets. So over to you, Julia. Thank you very much, Rosa. And I'm just going to share my screen. So uh, apologies if this takes a moment or two. Hmm. Uh, can you now see that as a full screen image? Yes, we can. It's perfect. Great. Thank you, Julia. OK, thanks. So off I go. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the links between transport and health and prosperity. And um, as Rosa mentioned, I work for the TCPA, the Town and Country Planning Association. The TCPA is a charity and we work across the UK and sometimes beyond the UK. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is homes, places and communities in which everyone can thrive. And some of the things we do is, for instance, we work with councils and with communities to think about how, as places change, they can make sure those changes will support people to live healthier lives. And quite recently, we've been working with North Yorkshire Council to think about how its new local plan could be a local plan that supports people to be healthy. So what I'm going to talk about is, is UK wide rather than specific to Yorkshire and Humber, but um, the figures don't vary a lot from place to place in, in a broad sense. And the UK as a whole has a crisis of poor health and it's affecting the economy and economists are starting to notice. It's been going on for some time. It happened, started to happen before the pandemic. Um, but as we've come out of the pandemic, it's become really noticeable that an awful lot of people in the population are ill. And economists are now realizing that with um, one in six UK workers, reporting to be uh, as long-term sick, that that is a real drag on the economy. Um, we need healthy workers to have a flourishing economy and to make us all prosperous. But apart from that, it, it's terrible from the point of view of people's lives. People are um, becoming ill uh, and they're getting avoidable illnesses that they could have avoided if things were slightly different. So, what creates healthy people? We usually think about the NHS as being the thing that keeps us healthy, but all the research shows that although the NHS is good at fixing people when they've become ill, it's not actually what keeps people healthy in the first place. The things that keep people healthy are the homes where they live, um, the places, the streets, the air quality. Is there a park nearby? Are there jobs nearby? Um, are there the buildings that people live in um, of good quality? Are they cold and damp or are they warm and dry? Um, and is the natural environment flourishing? And do you have neighbours you can rely on? Do you have friends and neighbours nearby? Being part of a community is something that really supports people's health. So if you get all of those factors right, you can help people stay healthy, you can influence the choices that they're able to make. It, you can make it easier for them to make healthy choices and that will keep them away from the NHS. So it'll improve people's lives and it will help have a sustainable NHS that we can afford as we go forward. And if you look at that circle on the right hand side, the bit in the middle is the stuff we can't change. You can't change how old you are, but the bits that we can change are those bits in blue and they're all influenced by planning and the built environment. 
And one of the things that um, it is now really well known is that probably the best thing that anyone can do for their health is to be a bit active. And this isn't about running the marathon or playing football or squash or something. It's about day-to-day -day physical activity. It's about walking down the street. It's about doing the housework, going to collect the kids from school, going to the park, walking to the shops, maybe cycling somewhere. It's that fairly low level day-to-day -day activity, which is fantastically good for people's health. And um, I think people, uh, the, the evidence is now so great, far stronger than it was a few years ago, that we all need to be active a bit um, most days. And the previous chief medical officer said, if physical activity were a drug, we would refer to it as a miracle cure. It's that good. And if you look at this chart, it shows some of the awful illnesses that um, you're less likely to get if you're physically active. So not only is your physical health improved, but your mental health is improved as well if you can keep active. So anything we can do to make it easier for people to be active every day will have a really power powerful effect on our health, the health of our communities. However, in England, there are some really quite shocking levels of inactivity. So a quarter of people do less than 30 minutes a week in a, of activity. I mean, that is, when you think about it, 30 minutes is absolutely nothing. You know, most, if you just walk to the shops and back, that's going to be 30 minutes. Um, so there are an awful lot of people who are incredibly inactive, really, really inactive. And if we can help those people be a little bit active, that will have a really transformative effect on their health and reduce pressure on the NHS. So creating walkable places, places where people want to walk, is something that can really benefit people's health. Um, it will lead to active and healthier communities, but it can also reduce air pollution because if we get out of our cars and we start walking, then there's less air pollution. And it's now known that even very, very low levels of air pollution cause ill health. Um, the, the evidence around that is, is so much stronger than it was. Um, so anything we can do to reduce air pollution will be very good for people's health. Uh, but also if people are able to walk around, they bump into their neighbours, they have a chat. And I think many of us realised during the pandemic that those small conversations that you might have with somebody in the street, you might have with somebody in the shop are just incredibly important. And we all really missed them when we were stuck in our homes. So creating places where people want to walk and where they will walk um, is really good for building stronger communities where people meet their neighbours more. Um, the other thing is walking is free. So that's a huge benefit. And it reduces the transport carbon emissions. Uh, so there are multiple reasons in terms of health and climate why if we can help people walk a bit more and get in their cars a bit less, um, it will be great for health and great for the climate. So people are only going to walk if the things they want to get to are nearby. So we need to start thinking about our neighbourhoods and whether or not they have the things that people need in them. And again, it was really noticeable during the pandemic when people were stuck at home that some neighbourhoods worked a lot better than others. And uh, if you can only walk a short distance, can you, can you find the things you need? Um, are the things you need directly accessible or do you have to walk all around the houses? Because if you do, you'll probably get in the car if you've got one. So thinking about neighbourhoods and whether or not they're complete, they have the things that people need, they're compact, you can get from A to B directly, and they're connected, that you can, um, there are good walking and cycling routes, is a way of helping create neighbourhoods where people can travel if they want to, but they'll find they don't need to as much as they would if the things they need are far, far away. And this is about increasing people's choice. It's about people choosing to walk and cycle because it, it works for them, because it's fun, it's the obvious thing to do, it's attractive, it's safe, they'll bump into people, they'll see their friends. And it's particularly important to think about people who are less um, physically able. Um, so are there places where people can sit? Are there benches so you, on the way 
to wherever you're going. If you get tired, you can sit down because that builds people's confidence. Are there good signposts so people know they won't get lost if they're going somewhere new? Um, we really need to think about what the people who are least able need in order to walk or cycle and to give them confidence. So that's about safety. It's about um, having places to stop and rest. It's about having good signposting and also having good public transport for those longer journeys. Um, it's also true that an awful lot of people don't have access for a car. Um, poorer households in particular don't have access to a car. And so creating places where a car isn't needed is going to help people with less money. There are ways of thinking about neighbourhoods and whether or not they have the things that communities want in them. And the place standard school, which it, place standard tool, which is used in Scotland, is a great way of talking to communities about whether they have the things in their neighbourhoods that they need. And there are all sorts of creative ways of bringing in the things that people might need. You know, if there's an empty shop, could it become a nursery? Could it become a, a cafe or a health centre? Um, but um, so creating neighbourhoods where people have what they need nearby and asking people what they want nearby is really important. But those neighbourhoods have to be connected with good public transport for those longer journeys, which are going to be necessary sometimes. Sometimes people say, well, that's all very well in towns and cities, but it won't work in the countryside. But there are some really interesting things happening where villages are getting together and um, sharing facilities, um, getting more, uh, more and better walking and cycling paths, um, and coming up with really creative ways to reduce their need to travel and to make traveling by foot or cycle safer and more attractive. Um, on our website, we've got lots of free resources. So do have a look at some of the videos and guidance. And in market towns, um, some market towns are now adopting neighborhood plans to make sure that once people get to the market town, they can get out of their cars, they can walk around, it'll be attractive and pleasant and safe, and that there'll be a good range of services so that people don't have to drive from one town to the next to the next to get what they need. So in conclusion, um, across the UK, there is an epidemic of poor health and it's spoiling people's lives and it's holding back the economy. Walking, cycling and public transport help people to live active and healthy lives. And people won't need to travel long distances if the things they need are nearby, or at least they won't need to travel long distances so much. And people will choose to walk or cycle if the routes are safe and attractive and convenient. But for longer journeys, good public transport is absolutely essential. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Julia. That was uh, really thought provoking. Some very, um, very compelling stats there around the health benefits of a more acti active travel lifestyle um, and some pretty stark um, stark notes there about, yeah, the, 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 the wealth disparity and what that what that means we need to be thinking about. So thank you very much for highlighting that. OK, so next we're joined by Peter Cole, Head of Decarbonisation for Transport for the North. So for those of you who don't know, Transport for the North makes the case for strategic transport improvements across the north of England. It's clear that the cancellation of the northern leg of HS2 has radically altered that case and the vision for our future transport system in the north. So how is Transport for the North responding to the government's decision? What are their priorities going forward? And how does that link to reducing transport emissions? Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Rosa. And can you see, can you give me the thumbs up if you can see my presentation? 100%, good to go. Right. Um, so I, I'm not massively going to answer that first question because um, we don't have an agreed position. It's something that we on the um, announcement around HS2 North of Birmingham or, or Network North. It's something we're working through with partners at the moment. Obviously, there's quite a lot to dissect and find out uh, around that decision. But I think um, whatever you think of HS2, uh, one thing is certain that we, we do still need the outcomes that it was going to deliver us uh, for the North uh, and, and particularly around that genuinely new and quite transformative level of rail additional rail capacity so I, i'll just leave that that thought there um 
because I'd like to spend most of my 10 minutes today uh, doing a bit of context setting, I guess, for the discussion later. Um, so this is a, a Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission led event. Um, so obviously the, the carbon context of, of what Yorkshire and Humber needs is, is really important. Um, so I just want to take a very brief foray into the recent past um, back, back, back to the, carbon, the uh, CCC's six carbon budget recommendations, which the government accepted and embodied sort of within the net zero strategy and the transport decarbonisation plan back in 2021. Now, that plan was, was challenged successfully on the basis that it, it didn't really include the policy detail or quantification uh, to give any confidence behind the ambitions and the targets that it set out. And uh, in response, the, the government published something called the Carbon Budget Delivery Plan, and that was earlier this year. Now, as far as I'm aware, despite the plan for drivers uh, and despite Network North uh, and numerous other government uh, announcements around the net zero agenda, the Carbon Budget Delivery Plan remains the government's latest published position in terms of decarbonisation. And there were two main changes from the net zero strategy in terms of transport. Um, the first one was that there was a, a shift to technology in, in terms of the uh, policies which were quantified to deliver carbon reductions. So that's represented by the blue in these pie charts. And I've shamelessly taken these from a presentation by Decarbonate uh, as part of uh, their um, study called Reverse Gear, which I fully um, uh, encourage everyone to go and read. Um, but yeah, so the, so the carbon reductions due to technological advances are in the blue. And we can see that on the left, we move from somewhere where it was a, uh, just over three quarters to almost entirely due to, to, to that technological solution. And at the same time, a massive reduction in the quantified carbon reductions attributed to policies, which were sort of demand side measures. And that was in the orange. Um, the other main change was we saw an overall decrease in the, the overall quantified ambition uh, uh, and the quantification of the government's policies when it comes to transport decarbonisation. So much so that a gap appeared between what the CCC said we needed to do and what was being delivered by government policies. And that gap is about 180 megatons of carbon. The document then went on to say that the delivery of emission savings by unquantified policies detailed in that plan would largely close the gap. So you can scoot down to schedule two or is it table two within the plan uh, to where they're, they're listed, those unquantified policies, and 16 of them relate to transport. But only seven of those 16 do the government feel could, um, could possibly make a material contribution to uh, reducing carbon beyond the levels uh, already quantified through their own policies. And of those seven, two relate to technical solutions, but we can see from these pie charts that they're really maxing out the art of a possible when it comes to carbon reductions from technological solutions. The other five relate to demand side measures. Uh, and I think probably the most significant of those is number 22. Number 22 is driving decarbonization and transport improvements at a local level by making quantifiable carbon reductions a fundamental part of local transport planning and funding. So number 22 is where it's at. On that basis, Network North, future funding and future funding decisions need to facilitate these types of local transport improvements. So that's the carbon context. But I just also want to put some context in terms of those wider outcomes, which to be fair, Julia expressed so well um, a, a minute ago, there's a really important set of numbers uh, and that's fundamental to the whole question of what we should invest this money in. Over a fifth of households in Yorkshire and Humber don't have access to a car or a van. 
and nearly a half of those house, uh, nearly a half of all households in Yorkshire and Humber only have access to one car and van. And that's important because when that car and van goes out, typically for a whole working shift pattern, that means everyone else in that household doesn't have access to a car. And at TFN, uh, we know through our transport related social exclusion research that over a fifth of the population of Yorkshire and Humber are at high risk of transport related social exclusion. And what that means is that that percentage of the population are at high risk of not being able to access a wide range of jobs, key services like uh, hospitals, wider educational and, and skills opportunities and also really important socializing opportunities at a reasonable cost and in a reasonable journey time, simply by virtue of not having adequate transport options available to them. So one of the key wider outcomes of improving our local transport system has to be inclusivity. And if we can do that, we should see increased economic participation, better access to those education skills, reduced loneliness, everything Julia was talking about, and those wider outcomes like air quality, reduced congestion for those who do actually need to drive, uh, reduced traffic accidents, the list goes on. So um, what would I actually spend the 19.8 billion on? Well, I'm not gonna actually get into the specific of schemes, I'm afraid, but I, I, rather I'd, I'd comment on what on how I'd spend that money. And much of what is on this slide and what I'm gonna talk about uh, is in our emerging strategic transport plan recommendations, which we hope to adopt early next year. And we talk about a long, the need for long-term funding allocations for local and regional authorities. And again, our SGP talks about that being uh, for at least five years. And those funding pots, the strings attached to them, need to be not attached to modes, not necessarily attached to geographies or types of community people, whatever this thing is, but actually linked to outcomes and the outcomes that local people actually want and the outcomes that Julia talked through and that I talked through just a moment ago. And if we can do that and give freedom to the local authorities, we can, actually, we can help them develop cohesive and integrated transport solutions for achieving all of those local outcomes. Now, sorry, there were a lot of buzzwords there, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that local areas know what they need best and they need the time and they need the freedom to create that. Any funding allocations need to also acknowledge the importance of revenue funding, and we also need medium term or, or even short term plans for actually weaning large parts of our local trans transport systems away from central government funding. Uh, now, our evidence reviews as part of our clean mobility work streams did tell us that combining incentive and demand side measures is the most effective way to achieve modal shift. But the people have to have a genuine alternative when it comes to a trans sustainable transport choice. And when I talk about those alternative transport choices, I'm going to quote from the CEO of a, a large charge point operator who I met at a recent EV conference I went to. And um, he was talking about the point at which he thought that the mass adoption of EVs would suddenly happen. And he said, it's going to happen when the price and the utility of owning and using EVs is as good or better than what has gone before, i.e. internal combustion engine vehicles. And I thought, actually, that's the same for pretty much everything. That's the same for public transport. You know, many technological and behavioral transitions have, have a, I mean, look, look at what we're doing at the moment, you know, the, the, the transition to hybrid and um, remote working and, and conferences. And, and it happens when it makes sense to people to do so. So the cost, and the level of convenience of using public transport has to make sense to people. And when we talk about cost, that brings me to my last bullet point around affordability. Tackling affordability of public transport has to be an absolute priority. 
Temporary measures like two pound bus fares, they're great, it's quick wins, but in the longer term, do we need more systemic change in our travel pricing systems so that they better reflect real world costs and real world benefits of each of those types of travel? And when I say that, I look back at my previous point about the importance of revenue funding and that need to have a plan to move away from central government funding. So hopefully that's some food for the discussion later on. And I'm just gonna leave it there, but with a quick plug of the range of tools that TFN is developing or has recently developed to help with the local decision-making and, and specifically that number 22 unquantified policy I talked to earlier on. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, really, really helpful. Um, and set, not only setting the, the national to northern scene, um, but really painting a picture of what um, what the opportunity is actually in Yorkshire and Humber, because we know what we need to do um, and people are ready to do it. So we just need the, the capacity, don't we? Um, that that it, very key context that you set there. OK, so without further ado, we'll move on to our final, but by no means least, uh, speaker this evening. So that is welcome Dr. Malcolm Morgan, um, who is a Senior Research Fellow for Transport and Spatial Analysis at the University of Leeds. Malcolm's research looks at how energy use and carbon emissions is spatially distributed, and he's the man behind one of the most useful tools analysing local carbon emissions, the Place-Based Carbon Calculator, which you can play with at www.carbon.place. So uh, Malcolm's here to talk about some new research carried out in partnership with Friends of the Earth into what's happened to our bus services over the last 15 years. We know there's been cuts, but what's the scale of the damage and what needs to happen now? So over to you, Malcolm. Thanks, Rosa. Can you just confirm you can see the slides? 100%, yeah, you're good to go. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, so yes, as Rosa said, this was a, a joint project with Friends of the Earth. It was launched uh, last week um, and there's, it's had a little bit of uh, media attention and uh, Friends of the Earth have put out a, a policy briefing and that there's a recording online um, of the launch event if, if you're interested. Um, and I've been kindly invited to give you a, a very quick summary of, of what, what the research showed. So, um, like like most research projects, they they start with a seemingly simple question that turns out to have a uh, very complicated answer. So the 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 question that I sort of started with was how does public transport vary around the country, and where is it getting better, and where is it getting worse? And you think that would be something that would be easy to find out, but it it turned out not to be. Um, and I think one thing to to reflect on this is is this has already come up in some of the other presentations, you, you would expect variation in public transport. You know, the centre of London is obviously going to have better public transport than a very remote area or up the top of a mountain. Uh, but what interests me is when you look at variations between, say, the centre of London and the centre of Leeds, both big cities, densely populated, ideal for public transport. Why, why are there such variations there? Um, and uh, uh, as, as we've heard already, the, the quality of public transport um, and ability to travel have big health implications uh, and pollution and all sorts of other things that are, are, are worthy of our attention. So uh, in, in terms of, sort of how to assess this question, I went out to get timetable data because that seemed like a good place to, to measure the, the service. Uh, the interesting thing is there's no official archive of public transport data in the UK. Um, there are places you can go to get the current timetable but they don't keep archives. So for the last six years, I have been begging, borrowing and scraping together every timetable I can find. And to, to my knowledge, this is the now the, the largest and most comprehensive digital timetable archive. Uh, the reason I emphasize the digital is there are organizations that archive the old paper timetables, but they're not terribly easy to analyze. Um, and so the data set we now have is 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 fairly extensive 
but it does have some gaps and I, I'll talk a little bit about the issues with that uh, in a minute. Um, but the, the goal was to, to get a sort of one month representative snapshot for each year for the whole country and then to convert all these different timetables that use different file formats and things into a standardized and comparable uh, set of files. Um, and so what we end up with is is this huge hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of, of timetables and then the question is well how do you convert that into something that's easily understandable and so what what we did was we did a, a sort of area neighborhood scale analysis for people who are interested in the technical details we used areas called lower super output areas just think of them as neighborhoods they're designed to have a population of about 1500 to 3000 people so they're quite small um, and that allows you to sort of look at local variation uh, but because they're roughly the same size in population they vary in size by area so in rural areas, they're bigger. In urban areas, they may even be a single street. They can be very small. Uh, but the, the measure that we were looking for was what is the public transport service within about 10 minutes of one of these areas? So you're just getting like the immediate vicinity and looking at the timetables, we can count the frequency of service at different times of day. So we can compare Mondays and Sundays. We can compare morning peaks with uh, nighttime and evening services and, and, and get a metric of the frequency of the public transport service. And then we get something that looks a little bit like this. So uh, this is just looking at buses and I've pulled out two graphs for two neighborhoods. Uh, one of them is a suburb of London and the other is a suburb of Manchester. And you can see it's it's a bit messy. It's a little bit complicated. Don't worry too much if you don't understand the detail. But the things I wanted to pull out is is if we look at the one on the the left of London, uh, you can see that there is some missing data. So uh, in this case, 2004, 2012, and 2013, we've just got no data at all. In 2005, there's there's some data, but you know that that looks odd. There's probably partial data, uh, and the, the the problem is that the these timetables are sort of voluntarily contributed by bus companies, and so there's the possibility that that like the important bus company in that area forgot or didn't bother to contribute data at that particular time, uh, and then in 2010 there's you know there's that sudden spike in service now that could be a genuine change sometimes services are brought in that that you know don't work and then they're withdrawn or maybe there's something like roadworks that cause a bus route to be redirected temporarily and we we've picked that up um or it could be you know a glitch with the data so the 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 thing to understand is like if you just pick a particular place and a particular time you might be subject to this sort of noisy problematic data but if you look at the general trend in London, you're seeing something that's fairly flat. There's a there's a trend for sort of steady public transport. But in the Manchester neighborhood, there's something interesting going on 2016, 2017, where there's a big drop. But outside that, there's that broader context of a general decline in public transport. The service today is significantly worse than the service was uh, in the past. So we can sort of do that kind of analysis repeatedly for every one of these tiny little neighborhoods and this sort of map gives you a sense of the how, how small those neighborhoods can get uh, so this is just looking at the the weekday morning service uh, this year the blue areas are where there's very high frequency service and the red areas are where there's there's low frequency service and immediately the the towns and the cities jump out as you as, as the blue blobs and the more rural areas are in the oranges and and, and the reds um, but as well as looking at the sort of weekday morning, which is often the, the metric that's used to describe public transport. But we know if we want genuinely good public transport, we want to serve a, a wider range of times than just rush hour. Um, so this is an example of the, the Saturday evening service. So here you're starting to see London is still that bright blue blob of really good public transport, even on a Saturday evening. Most other cities in the UK, we, it's dappled light blues and yellows, which means there's some service, but it's it's not really great. And then the rural areas, you're starting to get into those really deep reds, which is essentially no service at all. Uh, and the other thing we can do is we can look at the change over time. So uh, here, what I've done is I've made a... Um, what's called a bivariate map, a um, little technical term. It just means that we're using a little grid of colors 
to display um, two things at the same time. So, um, for example, the the um, oops, sorry. The the if you look for the top right of that little grid, you've got uh, places where the service was good in 2008, which was the sort of peak for public transport in the UK, and it's got better. And you can see pretty much the only place where there's a lot of green is is in London. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, sort of the, the really pinky areas are places where the service was bad in 2008 and it's got worse. And that's sort of a lot of rural areas. Um, and then in a lot of the urban areas in Britain outside London are sort of this dark blue, which had a reasonably good service in 2008, but it's got noticeably worse. So this, this is giving you a sort of sense of what the change is, but also what the baseline is. So there's some interesting examples like down here in, in Cornwall, there's a, there's quite a large area where it has a pretty poor service because it's a remote rural area, but it's got a little bit better. So there's a you know the occasional bit of good news in this. Um, so a couple of things that, that Friends of the Earth pulled out of, of the, the data I provided them. So they did some sort of regional summaries uh, and kind of simplifying the analysis that I showed you on the maps. You can see in London, things are largely a tiny bit better or a tiny bit worse, but sort of the same. Uh, and then everywhere else, substantially worse, regardless of what time of day or day of the week you look at. Um, and for me, like the really interesting comparison is, is this chart on the right hand side. So this is comparing um, the outside of London rural areas and outside of London urban areas, which are the blue and the orange lines with the London off the tube network. So that means the more suburban outer bits of London. So we're not looking right in the city centre now. We're, we're only looking at those sort of larger suburb areas. And you can see there's an enormous difference in the level of service. And then the black horizontal line is the Sunday night average for London. And so you can see that, you know, most urban areas, morning peak can't meet Sunday night service standard in London. And, and so that gives you a real sense of quite how big the gap is between London and, and the rest of the country. So um, this is we're an interesting point for me in, in this research. As I said, it's sort of taken six years to get to this point, but it's also really very much the first steps. This is the first time we've been able to bring all these timetables together and do this kind of comparative analysis. Um, and so for me, there's, there's a lot more work to do over the next few years to unpack all the detail um, and, and continue to work with the improving the data quality and the quality of the analysis. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in looking at is at the relationships between the frequency of public transport and other things that we might care about. So this graph on the right, for example, is very preliminary analysis looking at the relationship between bus frequency and car ownership. Uh, and the blue line is the sort of average line through the middle of this data. And you can see it's not really surprising in places where people have much better bus service, uh, they're, they're less likely to own as many cars. Uh, but you, you can guess where on, on this graph all the London neighbourhoods are. They're all kind of down at the bottom. Um, but there are a lot of other urban areas that could conceivably be moved down and to the right by improving their public transport and thus allowing people to own fewer cars, drive less and have all the benefits that that are associated with this. Um, so I, I'll stop there because uh, I know we, we need time for questions. Um, but thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Really, really fascinating. There were some questions in the chat um, as we were presenting, Malcolm, about in particular your y-axis on some of your graphs early, like early middle of your presentation, I think. And what was that uh, y-axis? Um, A naught to 100 axis. Okay, so that, that was bus trips accessible with uh, in an hour. Okay. Uh, so so it, it's a measure of the frequency of the public transport service. Um, so you might think of like a single bus route and maybe like if there's a bus every 10 minutes, then that, that's six trips per hour. And then you'd have six going the other way as well. So that would be 12. So, you know, that that that's a reasonably frequent single bus route. But if you're in a neighborhood with multiple crossing bus services, then you can get to, to much higher values. 
Okay, wonderful. Right, so um, thank you very much for that point of clarification. So we are now moving into, uh, we've got like 12 minutes for Q&A for our speakers before they leave us. Um, so please do make the most of that and use the Q&A function on Zoom to type in your questions. And if you're um, able to have a look at that, you can upvote some of the questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can. So we've got one in there already. Um, so now we'll kick off with that one. So on outcomes for local areas that know their own areas best, what protections could be put in place for freight or goods movement to ensure that transport is inclusive for all? Um, and by that, they mean all organisations and people. So people need goods provided by organisations and organisations need access to net zero supply chains. And the curtailment of HS2 and shift <laughs> the mode shift opportunity to rail for trunk haul rail freight may be a case for transport related organisational net zero freight exclusion, perhaps. That feels like quite a meaty question. Um, Peter, you've got a wry smile on your face. So I think you know that this might be coming to you, but do you have a response to that, please, for this participant? Uh, yeah, I guess quickly, um, on, on two points. On, on the quick one on the HS2 side, it, it, this comes back to that uh, rail capacity element. High speed two was never about high speed to me. It was about capacity mm -hmm. and you know we in our uh, stp we talk about for example a threefold increase in uh, rail freight now if we don't have a pretty transformational level of um additional rail capacity uh added then you know that sort of level of step up in terms of rail freight will have an impact on our passenger services so, you know, and, and if we want to increase the frequency of our rail services, then that will have uh, corresponding impacts on our ability to increase or even maintain the current levels of rail freight. So, yes, you're, you're quite, quite right. Um, that's a massive, massive issue and something that as Network North rolls out, I think it's something we've all got to be really alive to and, and make sure that we're advocating uh, for in terms of rail freight. Um, I think in terms of uh, your, your, your case about how, how do we put in place protections for, for freight goods movement, I think it's an interesting one because at an urban freight level, when we're talking about, particularly about last mile uh, freight, the two, the two aspects actually coalesce pretty well. Um, when we have uh, uh, non-zero uh, emission freight, um, so typically, uh, the the rise of of the white van and so on deliveries you know this causes a lot of issues around um, things like pavement parking um, air quality issues and and so on so and congestion issues so these these things are interrelated and we have seen a massive rise actually in in van mileage uh, particularly takeoff since covid so um, so I think that there needs to be uh, almost uh, there needs to be a concerted effort to, to provide local authorities almost with sustainable last mile freight handbooks or decision support tools and things like that you know so that's a that's a, a an invite to anyone on that front um, because um, you know it, it is an absolutely key element of what we now need to do in, in city centers and there are those sustainable freight options actually out there for last mile freight um, and it, more than any other sort of uh, uh, consideration when we come to, to zero emission, when, when we come to, sorry, um, uh, decarbonisation of transport, it's so place dependent, so place dependent as to the solutions you go for. Um, I will say one last thing, which is around um, package uh, rail uh, parcels delivered by rail into city centres. Um, and uh, this is something that used to happen quite a lot, um, but clearly there is uh, also opportunity to look at how we mesh passenger, existing passenger services, which aren't full um, with delivering sort of high, high value, smaller packages um, to um, sort of 
almost micro consolidation centers within city centers as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. I hope that goes some way to answering that person's question. It's very thorough. So thank you very much. Um, OK, so I've got a question now for Julia um, from Ruth Anderson in the main chat. Um, and the question is, how short is a short journey and how long is a long journey? Very often, as in one of Julia's slides, walking and cycling is seen as OK modes of travel for short journeys. However, for many of us, including me, a mile is now a long journey, even though it is not very far, because of decreasing mobility. So do you have stats, please, on the proportion of Yorkshire and Humber population in a similar uh, position? And incidentally, what contribution we make to the local economy? Thank you. Um, that's a, a really good question. And the answer is a long journey or a short journey depends on the person totally. It depends on uh, whether it's hilly and steep or flat and smooth. It depends on the local context as well. So there is no standard answer, um, but that's why I think things like the place standard tool are really useful because that's a way of talking to communities about what they think they need in their area. And that, I mean, what you can do is talk to different segments of the community and they're going to have different answers. So um, some people, perhaps older people, might say they need particular things nearby that they haven't got, which perhaps other people would feel quite happy to walk a long way to. So there isn't, there isn't one answer for everybody and it, it does mean talking to groups of people about what they need locally and then thinking really imaginatively about how what they need can be provided locally. And that might not mean that um, every community needs to have uh, X, Y and Z in separate buildings. You might be able to think about having um, mobile services. You might be able to think about having um, an empty shop that could be used for one use uh, in the morning and something else in the afternoon. Um, but bringing the services closer to people um, it, is really important. So I'm afraid that there isn't one answer, um, but it's absolutely vital that when we talk to communities about what they need in their area, that we talk particularly to older people about what they might need, people with um, physical disabilities about what they might need, uh, because that's the way to reduce health inequalities. For decades, places have been designed to suit the needs of fit and healthy young men. They haven't worked terribly well for women, they haven't worked terribly well for older people, and they haven't worked terribly well for children. So they've only really worked well for a minority of the population, and we need to ask other groups of people what they need and start designing for everybody and not just a small segment of the population. Wonderful. Thank you, Julia. Um, OK, so we've got the questions are coming in thick and fast. So what I'm going to say is we will do our best um, and hopefully with input from our speakers uh, to answer them all um, and, and write that up after today's session. I'm not sure we're going to get to Well, I know we're not going to get to all of them today. So I'm just going to put out a couple more. Um, so I think uh, there's one from James W in the main chat. So considering handing power to local authorities, I think this is for both Peter and Malcolm. Is this going to result in the best system? How do you mitigate for situations such as the removal or lack of installation of useful cycle lanes, like the ones installed in Chelsea that were taken out? These provided a link for boroughs further from central London than Chelsea. One borough is essentially cut off a link for all surrounding boroughs, which means the system will not work. So I guess actually maybe if I can give that to you, Malcolm, because that's a bit more about looking at that comparison to what's gone on, gone well in London and what, what we're learning um, for Yorkshire and Humber. So could you pick that one up, please? Uh, yes, uh, it, uh, it's an interesting question. And yeah, Kensington and Chelsea is, is the bane of London cycle planning. Um, okay. I, I think that for, for me, that what what's interesting is is that London has for a long time had its own sort of citywide planning system for transport uh, that is legally very different to what was imposed on the rest of the country. So we had things like bus deregulation that was forced on the rest of the country, but London was exempted from. Um, and for me, the kind of citywide city region scale planning is the correct way to do transport. 
uh, and really, we like the Department of Transport should be a a small department that does a little bit of notional support, and all the money and all the decisions should really be taken at that kind of more city scale. That that's how I would do it. And if if you look at the the places in the country where they have that, like London, they, they have good public transport. Everywhere else doesn't, and it, I to me that doesn't surprise at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think. You know, there's there's that like local individual local authority is too small national is is too big city scale uh, or region is is the correct scale um and and a, you know that requires changes in laws that requires like major restructure of how government funding is done but i honestly don't think unless we do that anything else will matter so you know all this like oh there's now all this money from hs2 that's going to be spent I, I'm very skeptical. It will make any difference at all without that that structural reorganisation of who who raises the money, who decides how it is spent, and who can benefit from from reinvestment. Because largely, local authorities the, the, stimulating the economy in your local authority doesn't help the local authority because they don't get any tax revenue from it. Mm. Whereas in London, you know, things like the the new Elizabeth Line, they got community buy in to raise taxes to fund it. You, know, you can't do that at a local authority level. That's a city scale thing. And you need an organization with that kind of count. Yeah. And, and TFL is a huge organization. It's, you know, recently someone pointed out to me, TFL's turnover is bigger than Uber's worldwide turnover. And that's just one city. But when you have a massive public transport network yeah. um, and that everybody uses, you, you get that kind of scale. And that's, you know, the kind of thing that like Transport for the North could be with the right legal powers. I've thrown Peter in it if he wants to take on that role. Um, but yeah, I think that that's the key thing, that that organisational structure. Uh -huh. That's really thought provoking. Thank you. Um, OK, so uh, we've got a, a prompt from David Lowe to not forget our fine system of large waterways radiating from the Humber inland to York, Wakefield and Lees, Rotherham and Nottingham, which only need minimal investment and where each barge can be up to 20 more lorries off the road with 75% savings in emissions, etc. So just a prompt around the last mile could be possible in the conurbations using the waterways um, more. Um, I do remember in Leeds a lot of work around that, around Sturton at one time, but I'm not sure where that's got to. So if uh, panellists have any comments on that, please do come back. We've got a question from Colin Speakman, uh, which I'll put to all three of you because I think it's pretty cross-cutting. Cross Can we match the massively massive advertising of car-based glamorous lifestyles by the car industry with campaigns to encourage young people, especially to lead, young people especially, to lead car-free lives? Um, any thoughts on that, guys, before we wrap up? driving the culture change through advertising. Well, I'll say something about that. Yeah, um, I can put you, yeah. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to do the advertising. I think that um, places around the world, all sorts of different places have demonstrated that if you create good public transport, attractive, safe streets, safe cycle networks, people just start to behave differently. Um, if if when you open your front door, what you see outside is really nice and you want to walk down there and you have a great time when you do walk down there, then that's what you'll do. So rather than spend the money on advertising, I would spend the money on actually making the change to the infrastructure. Interesting. Good challenge back to Colin there, Julia. So thank you. Um, OK, so one of fine. I mean, there are so many good questions. Um, some are for the commission directly. We'll, we will come back to you on that. Um, uh, separately. So question mainly for Transport for the North, but for others too. Uh, the decline, and, and I would like an answer from all of you, please. Um, so the decline in funding of public transport has spanned governments of all colours. In another era of austerity, what do we think the magic solution is to changing the view in government toward all the arguments presented here about the benefits of access and transport at a much greater level? And I'll stop there. What do you think about that? So I'll go in order that people spoke. So Julia, you first, then Peter, then Malcolm. OK. Um, we're facing a massive public health crisis. Lots and lots of people aren't well. Yeah. 
the way to solve that, because, because the things that shape our health don't just sit in the Department of Health. The things that shape our health are partly in the Department of Transport. They're in education. Um, they're split across government departments. If we want to tackle it, every government department needs to have in its targets something about improving public health. And as soon as the Department for Transport has that in its targets, it will be so obvious that um, a really small shift of budgets out of cars and road building and into public transport would make sense because it would help achieve public health outcomes as well. It, it, it would start to do that. Um, my understanding is um, that Transport for London does have a public health target in its targets and that's one of the things that has helped it make more investment in uh, streets and pedestrianisation and cycling over the last few years but I, th I think that would the amount spent on roads and tra and uh, cars is absolutely phenomenal it's huge mm. even mm. if a small shift was made to walking and cycling it would make and public transport it would make a big difference okay thank you Julia and Peter your reflections on that in advance of an election, if you can. Uh, <laughs> Might yeah, be a bit I, quickly. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we, we know a lot more now than the, in, in the past about the cost of car dependency in terms mm -hmm. of sedentary lifestyles, air quality impacts, you know, um, NHS costs, climate change costs. Um, so I think it is slightly different now. I think it's about pre presenting that um, in a way, and I, I, I sound like a broken record on this, but at the end of the day, we live in these four year, four to five year systems of political cycles where, where people, where, where unfortunately politicians will follow, you know, public opinion. So we need to affect the public opinion. And, and, and so um, I think it is about leading out on the outcomes that are more, uh, that are important to people, you know, and, and they are public health or personal health. Um, uh, it might not be climate change. It might not be carbon. Sorry, wrong audience. I know, but I I do think that we need to be better at leading on the outcomes that that matter to people, and then I Absolutely. think our governments will follow that. Yeah, no, I I really agree with you. Actually, we you know we don't need to if we know that an action has climate change related benefits, um, but that isn't what's tipping people into action. Then we lead with something else. It's all they're all valid outcomes, aren't they? Um, so go with the one that has the impact. Completely agree. And over to you, Malcolm, our final words for the Q&A. I think I agree with everything that, that has been said. The only thing I'd, I'd challenge with the original question was that, that there's been big cuts to spending on transport. I think spending on transport is at record highs, but it's it's hidden in the way it's done it. So, for example, we've had years and years of freezing fuel duty, which is a huge subsidy for drivers. We have huge amounts of money spent both public and private sector providing free parking which is an enormous subsidy. Now, there's no such thing as free parking. If you park for free at the supermarket, you're paying for that parking with higher food bills. Uh, and that's not fair on people who don't drive. Also, like with supermarkets in the UK, they tend to stand, um, have standardised national prices. So that means people in the north where land is cheaper are subsidising the food bills of richer people in the south. Is that fair? No. Are people angry about it? No, because they don't know about it. Um, mm. And so, you know, we've also got a massive road building program. We've spent 20 billion or something on, on road building in, in the last few years. And it's added like 0.1% to the network and it hasn't done anything to alleviate congestion. It's just made the problem worse. So there's huge amounts of money sloshing around. It's about where we choose to put it and about recognizing the enormous amount of subsidy we put into the car for very little benefit mm. yes good um well good illuminations there malcolm to uh to draw us to a close on that i mean i'm smiling but that's because i'm being polite but that's all really quite upsetting stuff isn't it? it's just sort of the silent hands um at, at play there that we need to really watch and challenge and influence so thank genuinely thank you very much for for highlighting those okay so we are now going to so thank you very much for your questions um to be fair keep adding them um we are going to move into uh breakout rooms now so um we're going to split everyone into rooms for um 
well yeah we're a little bit over so 15 to 20 minutes maybe more like 15 minutes to be able to enable a bit of a discussion rather than just the q a that we've had now um albeit that was very interesting so enable you to talk amongst yourselves within this call again if you don't want to um participate in this um please just stay off camera and on mute and, and just listen um if you do want to um if you do want to take part in it, then if you can, we'd encourage you to put your camera on because that's just helpful in this virtual world to uh, get the conversation going. OK, so um, our panellists or guests, um, if you want... Wonderful. I hope you have found that useful to be able to share your views with us. We certainly very much welcome it. Um, and some really interesting points being made in the in the group that Kate and I were in. It, those breakout rooms are always a little bit brutal, aren't they? So if you had your hand up as we came back into this room and you didn't get a chance to make your point or um, ask your question um, then and sh or share a reflection, then please do so in the main chat or send that through to... Uh, one of the facility your group facilitator and if you don't want to share it publicly um, and then we will uh, yeah be able to take it on board so don't don't miss the opportunity to share it with us directly um, just because we ran out of time okay so we are drawing to the end of our session and I would like to us to finish roughly on time so I will hand without further ado I'll hand over to Kat Armstrong in our team um, to do the final presentation I think you might be on mute, Kat. Rookie mistake. Thank you, Rosa. No problem. Easily done. Um, there we go. What can you see? Can you we see can my see notes? Your notes. Yeah. Oh, embarrassing. There we go. Let's figure. Let's figure this out. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Just a minute. Share screen. What can you see? Can you see? Uh, you can see three? your slides. You're good to go. See the slides. Okay, great. So, hello. Um, so I'm Kat Armstrong. Um, so I'm in here. I'm here to introduce you to the ongoing consultation, and hopefully, as you saw in my notes, hopefully convince you to feed in, and of course, to spread the word as well. Um, so this presentation is a. I've tried to keep it as quick as possible, um, because we are, um. Sorry, just a second. Um, I want to kind of make sure I don't take too much of your time. Um, so it's a very quick summary to the report that we're consulting on. Um, here we go. Okay, so sorry, I'm just having computer issues. I'm trying to figure out where my, where my notes are. Okay, so transport. Um, as we've discussed today, um, everyone needs to get around, um, and at the moment, the number one way to do that is in the car. Um, but as we've talked talked about it's not really working. Um, Yorkshire and Humber's transport system isn't working um, and it's got a lot of downsides at the moment. It locks people out of the, the transport system who don't drive um, or can't afford a car. Um, it is, of course, the second um, largest source of emissions in the region after industry. And as we've discussed, it doesn't really work for drivers either. You know, if everyone has to use the roads, they get extremely congested um, and, of course, as bad air quality, traffic accidents, the list goes on. Um, so on the positive side, um, as we've heard from our speakers and in discussions today, there is a lot to gain from transforming transport and it's got to be transfor transformation, no more, no less. Um, and of course, the numbers back that up. Um, but how do we do it um, in the region? So earlier this year, uh, we put together a deep dive delivering impact session on transport where we brought in six expert speakers um, to answer the question so what needs to happen in transport and how do we do it um, and you can watch that session on YouTube I'm online uh, so what does the region need um, just a second um, what does the re region need so we discovered that ambition is really high across the region within local um, local local authorities combined authorities businesses um, and in many ways it needs to accelerate um, but what does the region need um, although of course electric vehicles will play a role um, as we've talked about today 
supporting people to walk, cycle and use public transport brings us the most benefits. People do want to walk, um, cycle and use um, and, and kind of use these transport modes, but they can't do it now. Um, it's either too unreliable, it's too expensive, it's too unsafe. I kind of feel like when I try and cycle, I used to a lot more, um, but it feels like an extreme sport, to be honest. Um, how can we expect huge numbers of people to take that risk? Um, and we can look to countries where it's been done before, um, and that's the model that we can follow. Um, it's not about asking people to change, it's about providing the infrastructure that people need. And it's not rocket science, as we talked about in our breakout room. It's easy stuff, really. It's been done before. And we can use this as an opportunity to bring nature and community back into our streets. But however, we are not the government, um, and that's a big part of the discussion, is that we've got to try to figure out, as a region, what we can do ourselves. Um, so in the paper, we've outlined three lead, three potential levers within the um, the region region's control that are in our hands. So we've got engagement and bold leadership. As we said, people understand what their local area needs are. Let's make sure we have resource for proper engagement. But of course, we still need bold leadership as well to tell that positive vision of what's possible, get public support and to take bold action. Um, coordinated planning across and between local and regional authorities. Again, that's something that's come up today. Uh, we need the, that planning um, and powers for our transport system, which is dissipated across lots of different organisations and within teams within those organisations, um, public health, environment, uh, transport. So how do we support those organisations to, to take action um, and improve that? And then, of course, the money, which is a big part of the, the kind of the theme of today, it's, it's around investment and um, there's a question there around how do we use a range of sources? Um, the Climate Change Committee estimate that uh, 10 billion a year is needed to get to net zero in transport. So that's a lot of money um, every single year. So how can we use lots of different sources to, to kind of create those changes? So let us know what you think. Uh, we want to hear from you. And this is what our commonplace consultation is all about. I've given you a brief summary of the report, but take a look at it, give it a read. We've tried to make it as interesting as possible. I think it's interesting. Um, complete the survey. Um, you can also respond to other people's comments on the on the um, on the platform as well. Um, we'll put that link in the chat. And yeah, this is an opportunity to to take part in the region's decision making pro uh, process. Um, we analyze these comments and we put those in front them in front of decision makers across the region so you know please take part and, and join in the conversation and i'll stop there thank you wonderful thank you very much kat um so yes yeah, so we're drawing to a close now everybody so thank you very much for coming um logging on this evening and hearing from our wonderful speakers um, and for contributing in those discussion sessions and for the lively Q&A um, uh, questions coming through. Um, we will follow up with an email and share with everyone the presentations and the main findings from the breakout rooms, as well as some links to the initiatives around the region you might want to get involved in. Um, and we'll pull out from the chat uh, some of the key links uh, that were shared there as well. So, uh, and where we can, we will promote existing campaigns too through our, uh, like our members bulletin and so on. Um, and uh, the recordings from the presentations today will be available on YouTube, our YouTube channel in the next couple of days, so keep an eye out for those. Um, in the chat, you already had the links for the Commonplace consultation that Kat just introduced and the associated recording for that delivering impact session. So some more um, really insightful presentations from uh, a range of experts to inform that discussion. So please do check that out as well. And uh, for now, then, um, I will draw us to a close and albeit it feels a bit early on the 4th of December, but it is the time of year. So I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and good night. Take care, everyone. Thank you.